Exit Mundi is a website that tells you exactly what it's about at the top of the page. A collection of end of world scenarios. Yeah, that pretty much sums it all up. Here's a website from the late 90s with a final update in 2008. It's a website that wants to catalog every way the world could end. It's a very simple looking website. You have the logo at the top left with the website's phrase above it. On the left are a group of links with names like Planet X, Meteors, and Black Holes. These are expectedly some of the ways the world can come to an end. The main section of the site that you're going to want to look through though are the thumbnails in the middle. This is a timeline of when the world could end. They are separated into four distinct groups. Firstly, we have Any Day Now, which is a collection of events that can happen at any time. Next is the Near Future, which goes from 07 to 2400. Considering the Near Future's starting date was almost 20 years ago, I think this website could use some updating. After that comes the Distant Future, which picks up 100,000 years ahead. The final is Religion, which looks to cover several religious world-ending scenarios. Each section has a single word along with a thumbnail to describe what you're looking at. For some of them, it's pretty easy to tell, while others, not so much. Some of the images I recognize from stock photos, some from movies, and some from video games. Let's take a look through some of these, hitting a few in each section, starting with the Any Day Now section. Firstly, we have Zap, the first link in the row. This one starts with a story about how life is most likely out there, in space I mean, and that life becomes furious at humanity and kills us all. This doomsday scenario is one of aliens coming to Earth and taking us all out. Either they do this from the comfort of their spaceships or on the surface of Earth itself. The main point of this article may be about the world ending scenarios of aliens, but most of it is spent on pondering whether aliens actually exist or not. It's a good starting point and there are loads of images to go along with the story they are weaving. There's even a movie review at the bottom. Well, kind of. They didn't like War of the Worlds. I, I guess that makes sense. The next link I clicked on was prefaced with Boyle, and I had an idea of what it was going into. The runaway greenhouse effect is a climate change end of world scenario that has been studied by climatologists for a few decades now. This is what the article is discussing. Here's an excerpt from the start of the article. Phew, aren't we lucky. In the 1990s, they predicted we would get climate warming. The poles were about to melt, they said. Entire countries would get flooded. Huge hurricanes would sweep across the globe. Millions would die. Well, they had it all wrong. It's the 21st century now and little has happened so far. But then, suddenly it all changes. From one month to the next, the climate of the world goes wild. Temperatures jump, the ice caps of the poles crumble, pushing the sea levels up. The snow caps on the mountain tops melt, turning even the tiniest rivulet into a roaring body of water. Cities are flooded. Countries washed away. Tornadoes and hurricanes push across the globe. Harvests fail. Economics crumble. Tropical diseases like malaria and dengue push northwards. Forests turn into deserts, and of course, millions of people perish during all the mayhem. And if you thought that was bad, you haven't seen nothing yet. Within a few decades, the situation goes totally out of hand. Temperatures just keep rising, faster and faster. And as they do, more and more water on Earth begins to evaporate. The sea level begins to drop again. If you're one of those poor souls who had their country or city flooded when the ice caps melted, you might be glad to find the sea is retreating. But don't put that flag out yet. What you're witnessing is the end of the world. Nothing more, nothing less. The runaway greenhouse effect states that if too much greenhouse gas gets released into the atmosphere, it would become too dense to ever cool. This would lead to all sorts of disasters, including floods, tsunamis, and eventually turning landscapes into deserts. The scientists that saw this as a possibility pointed to Venus as an example. It's a planet with an atmosphere thicker than Earth's by a wide margin. Venus lives in what exactly the runaway greenhouse effect exemplifies. A world that is so hot that life cannot live on it. This was seen as a possibility in the 90s and early 2000s. Luckily in 2012, another subset of scientists were able to prove that the runaway greenhouse effect was nearly impossible to happen to Earth. They stated that there was nowhere near enough greenhouse gases created by humanity to create what has happened on Venus. There are quite a few more natural disaster world-ending scenarios listed here. This includes a great flash created by a star being devoured by a black hole, an ice age created by climate change, super comets hitting Earth, a tsunami that floods the world, the moon falling out of our orbit, and a black hole devouring us. This website is extensive with its research and understanding of each of these world-ending events. Let's take a look at a few that aren't caused by the planet itself. The one that most people probably think of first 
is one that felt like a possibility not so long ago. A nuclear apocalypse created by the world's governments. Here's another excerpt from their article. There's nuclear war, and now the SBMs, ICBMs, and SLBMs cross the sky like oddly shaped featherless birds of destruction. All hell breaks loose. There's eye-popping flashes of light everywhere and ear-ripping bangs as the bombs go off. Cities evaporate. Infrastructures crumble. Everywhere, huge mushroom-shaped clouds tower up into the sky. All electricity goes out because of electromagnetic effects. And of course, many die. According to even the mildest scenarios, hundreds of millions die instantaneously as the nukes go boom. But you, you survived all that. Better take shelter. For the next days, it will rain highly radioactive fallout particles. For almost three days and three nights in a row, it will rain radioactivity in a region several hundreds of kilometers around each impact site. And to be honest, it's best you stayed indoors for a whole year, patiently waiting until radioactivity levels finally begin to drop. But wait, there's more trouble. As the mushroom clouds begin to fade, the real consequences of nuclear war become apparent. From the explosion sites, huge amounts of evaporated stuff, smoke and soot rise up into the sky. It's quite different from the usual smoke columns that come from fires. The intense heat from the nuclear impact sites pushes the debris straight into the highest parts of the atmosphere, the so-called stratosphere. There, it slowly starts to disperse, covering even bigger portions of the world. But what's worse, the soot blocks the sun. Within days, a weird and unprecedented climate shift sets in. Total darkness covers everything. Temperatures drop rapidly, and chances are the soot blanket that prevents the sun from shining spreads across the globe, transforming even the Latin Americas, Asia, and Africa into chilly shadow worlds. There you have it, the infamous dreaded nuclear winter. Within weeks, it's minus 23 to 30 degrees Celsius everywhere. Do you live near the shore? Consider yourself lucky. Since oceans cool so slowly, temperatures near the sea will drop only some 5 to 10 degrees. But there is a downside. Because of the big temperature differences between the sea and the inland, unimaginable storms and hurricanes will harass the coastal areas. This is only the beginning of the issues with nuclear war. This article does a good job of setting you up for it though. It tells you what happens, but not the politics of who did it. It's a great read, it continues further with a nuclear winter section. Nuclear end of the world scenarios have always been popular. Well, ever since the first nuke dropped. There are hundreds of books, movies, and games about this end of world scenario. In fact, one of the most popular gaming franchises of all time, Fallout, uses this scenario as its story setting and backdrop. There's something so poetic about the world coming to an end by the hands of the ones that currently sit at the top of its food chain. The politics aside, the nukes aren't just a poetic end of the world, but they are a very real threat that still exists. One that several governmental bodies still possesses. It's fun to read about the end of the world after the nuclear war. It's less a fun thought to remember that there were moments in time where it could have been a reality. Continuing down the row, we have an article about disease. This article discusses a disease that could come into play that could wipe out the entirety of humanity before we can even find a cure. This scenario ranks highly on their website. They list several types of influenza that have come and gone and the devastating effects they've had on society. It isn't so far-fetched to think that a disease could be our downbringing, especially with how quickly a strand of anything can spread across the globe. They claim that it's only a matter of time, really. If we look back to a few of the biggest diseases to wreak havoc on our populace, it's a very real scenario. You don't even have to go back to the time of the Black Death. We had polio and a more recent influenza that wreaked a ton of havoc on our society. This scenario, like the nuclear one, feels closer than the website gives it credit for. While a lot of these seem to fall back on some science as a reason to fear it, there are a few that have none to back it up. The articles only exist because the scenario is interesting. This is the case with the Matrix Theory, which gets its own article. I discussed the Matrix Theory before on my channel, but it's one that has come up quite a bit in my research. Essentially, the Matrix Theory states that we are all part of a computer simulation that some supercomputer is running. Most of the belief is that there is an advanced race or after humans that are running our simulation to test something. Once that hypothesis has been proven or disproven, they'll just disconnect us. In an instant, all life in our universe will just be gone. It's like we never existed, because we technically didn't. This theory is extremely popular online. The subreddit for it has 1.1 million people. The theory has its believers, but most of it's based entirely on hypotheticals. There isn't any hard science to prove it. 
yet. Of course, there's also the theory that if we were to prove it, the simulation would just end. Knowing you're part of an experiment kind of makes the evidence you get from it null, so I guess I hope we never prove it. Moving to the next section, we can see more scenarios set around the modern day, though 2012 is far in our rearview mirror now. It wasn't that long ago that many believed that the world would end on the 21st of December, 2012. The 2012 end of world scenario was based entirely on the Mayan calendar and spread heavily online, but the most quickly through YouTube. Let's take a look to see what the article says. The article claims that the Mayans were able to predict every single solar event with incredible accuracy thanks to their calendar system. They had predicted that the sun would be in perfect alignment with the center of the galaxy. They called this the sacred tree, but never mentioned what was supposed to happen that day. Further claims are made that Mayans were able to predict how their society would be overrun by Spaniards. The Spaniards then proceeded to destroy every book that the Maya might have had concerning why the calendar ended on that specific date. So the end of world scenario was born from the lack of knowledge, which is how many rumors are started actually. There were a lot of theories about 2012 before it happened. Thoughts that there would be a nuclear war started that day, or maybe it was a biblical judgment day, or even that a natural disaster from the stars could wipe out all of humanity. This didn't happen, of course. 2012 came and went, much like every world ending date predicted by people. This one wasn't predicted by the Mayans though, and it more so came from people's speculation. It has led to a movie, a few books, and even an entire alternate history that someone had created. What about how the world came to an end or started its descent towards the end? Which some people actually believe to be the downward turn of society. Some in the Matrix Theory community even believe that the date was important for something in the simulation. Like we diverged at some point from that date. Again, this is just speculation, mostly for fun. There are quite a few other sections worth mentioning, but I really just want to cover one final one. That is the zombie apocalypse scenario. When this article was written, the world hadn't quite gotten bored of zombie culture yet. Things like The Walking Dead hadn't started and Left 4 Dead 1 had just come out. That didn't mean there wasn't plenty of zombie culture to influence the article though. There were a whole slew of films that focused on the dead rising and killing us all. Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead came out in the 70s and 80s respectfully. The idea of the cannibal zombie was already starting to take on life in pop culture. The 2000s and early 2010s saw the rise in zombie apocalypse stories and scenarios though. There were hundreds of different zombie scenarios that could play out. There were the infected, which could be created by disease, or the cursed that were dead bodies reanimated. The amount of types of zombies were pretty incredible, and the versatility of the creature was almost limitless. This article takes on the more popular movie versions made famous by the two films I mentioned before. They also mentioned 28 Days Later, which is a great movie. Needless to say, they have no science for any of the backing, but that doesn't take away from the interest this end of world scenario has generated. This section mostly focuses on how this scenario would play out if zombies actually overtook the earth. That's about all the scenarios I wanted to go through for this video. I haven't even scratched the surface as there are loads of articles based on everything from the biblical end of the world to a lab created fungus that kills us all. This website is packed full of content and I highly recommend any internet archeologist to check it out. Going from end of world scenarios to a website that doesn't contain as much doom and gloom, this is a website created for the film Mallrats. Mallrats is a movie by Kevin Smith of Clerks fame, but I haven't seen either film, so I can't really talk about them. What I can talk about is this website. The landing page is definitely of its era, a black background with a poster for the movie. Underneath that is some green text inviting you to the mall, the one the movie took place at. Even further below that is a message from Kevin Smith about the movie. Kevin. I think Mallrats is very funny. I'm on your side. It's a movie that's very dear to my heart, but it went right in the shitter. When you do a movie like Clerks, then a movie like Mallrats that goes right down in the shit can, everyone says, haha wise ass. So rather than subject yourself to that, you steal their thunder by saying it first. There's this infamous moment where I was on stage giving an award away with Laura Dern, and I opened up by saying, I want to take this time to apologize for mall rats. I don't know what I was thinking. It was said in a very tongue-in-cheek fashion. It was a joke, but some people thought it was serious. Roger Ebert, in his interview of Chasing Amy, said, He started out with a great movie called Clerks, then followed up with a movie that was so bad that he apologized for it. The movie was not received well upon release, though now the movie has been dubbed a cult classic and one that many people described as a hidden gem. I haven't seen it, like I said, so I have no opinion here. 
Below this paragraph, we can see a copyright date for the website, 1997 to 1998. This doesn't mean that the website was last updated during those dates, as we'll see one update in 1999. It does mean that most of the content we're going to see was copyrighted between those dates though. Let's enter the mall. Clicking on the link takes us to this page. There's a paper-like background behind everything, with another Mall Rats logo on the top left. In the center is a row of links. Each of these links takes you to a different part of the website, but the most interesting ones are the mall and the pictures link. Let's start exploring the mall. We're brought to the Eden Prime Mall directory. Here there are two maps of the mall. The first shows us a few of the shops that we're likely to find. Well, they're more links to different behind the scenes stuff from the film, but they are supposed to represent stores. The second map is of the food court, which has more links to behind the scenes stuff. The first store is the movie Info Haas. Here we can get a backstory to the movie. It tells us where the film takes place, in Red Bank, New Jersey, but that it was actually shot in Eden Prime, Minnesota. There are other aspects of the film that were not put into the fully released film for reasons like it did poorly with test audiences to it had to be cut for time reasons. These are kind of lost on me, but it's still fun to see behind the scenes work like this. Next is the gallery of images. This one is pretty easy to understand. It's just a gallery of some images from the film. A lot of these aren't anything special as far as images go, but they must hold sentimental value for the director. There's a certain vibe to these images, like I'm reliving a piece of someone else's memories. One of the more interesting images is of the quote, famous hot tub pic. I'm not sure what makes it famous, the fact that everyone looks tired or what. Next door is a cineplex with QuickTime videos. These appear to be just scenes from the movie, but I wouldn't know since I couldn't get the player to work. So I guess we can just look at the thumbnails. There's one of Stan Lee down there. He did a cameo for the film. There was a comic book theming to the film from what I've heard and read on the website so far. The next shop is sounds from the movie. In the section that is probably the most interesting is comic book art. These pieces of art all relate to the characters from the movie, as far as I can tell. The title is Comic Toast, and there are just a lot of fun and very timely joke-based comedic art. My favorites are the Legends of the Dork Knights, The Incredible Bulk, New Jersey 07732, and The Buttman Adventures. There's some very interesting artwork in here, if you're so inclined to check it out. It feels so much like it fits into the world that they've created. The final section is set in the food court. Here we have lost Mallrats footage, which is a promise for a special collector's edition of the movie set to be released in 2005. I can't wait. Next is a story in pictures, which tells the story of how the movie was directed in a short six image series. It's more behind the scenes stuff, but it was fun to look behind the lens. The final part is behind the scenes where two members talk about what it was like working on the film. It's a fun reading to some of the people that made the movie and the atmosphere on the set something that we get a lot of in today's world. Leaving the mall as we've seen all it has to offer, we arrive back on the paper screen. Here we have three quick images of the stars of the movie. They are labeled by their characters. If you click on them, you get to see some of their famous quotes from movies they're in and the clips that they appear in. That's all there is to see for the Mallrats website, a tiny piece of history that has persisted on the internet since 97. It's been online longer than a lot of people I know, which is kind of the fun of the internet getting to see what remains beyond social media and the surface web. The website feels like a man trying to defend his film that bombed, but also like a man that loved making the movie. He wanted to share all of these secrets with people and figured the best way to do so was with a website. A website that thankfully he left up for us to find and explore. Let's continue to dig and see what we can find. Before we get into this next website, I want to give a disclaimer. While I find a lot of these conspiracy theories, and theories in general, to be interesting, just talking about them doesn't mean that I believe in them. I'm just reporting on what I'm finding. The old internet has a lot of fringe theory believers that have interesting beliefs. Whether those are rightfully founded or not. With that out of the way, our next website is called The Pentacon. And as I was writing this section, something crazy happened. The website went down. Its domain no longer loads for some reason which would make this hard to research, but I can look it up on the website, The Wayback Machine, so we can still see what it has to hide. Citizen Investigation Team presents The Pentagon. This website is designed entirely around one conspiracy theory, a conspiracy around 9-11. This conspiracy is supposedly detailed in a documentary that this website hosts. First, let me read you their opening paragraphs. 
You have reached a website hosting a documentary with groundbreaking witness interviews proving the 9-11 official story false. There are many aspects of 9-11, but this movie focuses specifically on the events as they happened at the Pentagon. These first-hand eyewitness accounts were obtained by Citizen Investigation Team in a persistent effort to find the truth in light of a myriad of questions. We contacted as many of the previously published eyewitnesses we could obtain contact information for, and we canvassed the neighborhoods of Arlington, Virginia, on foot in a quest to find previously unknown witnesses. Our goal was to establish the final flight path of the plane before it reached the Pentagon, as seen by the eyewitnesses. The results are devastating as we now know for sure that the plane could not be what damaged the Pentagon or the light poles. We first present the smoking gun version featuring quadruple corroborated testimony showing beyond a reasonable doubt that the plane flew on the north side of the Sitgo station, completely contradicting the official story. The simple fact makes it impossible for the plane to have toppled the light poles and damaged the buildings as outlined in the building performance report by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Since the release of this presentation in 2007, we have uncovered an astronomical amount of corroborating evidence and this can be viewed in our acclaimed subsequent presentation titled National Security Alert, available to view on our primary website, citizeninvestigationteam.com. Their website is one that we'll be getting to later. So this website holds evidence of the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. It's supposed to show that the whole story that was told the American people in the world was actually wrong. That's part of some cover-up. Continuing down the page are a bunch of links that no longer work. There's also other videos that support their theory, but those are also lost on the Wayback Machine version. I can't even watch their main documentary. I clicked on the View Movie tab and I met with this. The video couldn't be archived, but it looks like it might be available on YouTube, so I can watch it there instead. We'll discuss the film later. Let's keep exploring the website. The next tab is DVD, which is just a way to get a DVD copy of the film. They tell you how to download the thing and burn it onto your computer, which is free of course. Or you could buy a copy from them for $45 if you're in the US, $50 if you're in Canada, and $55 for international buyers. I'm not sure why you would want to do this when you can just watch it for free on YouTube. There's a section which holds all of their videos. These are all related to the same conspiracy and each varies in length. Some are an hour or more, while others are just 10 minutes long. Most, if not all, are interviews with people who allegedly saw the attack that day. All of these videos can be found on the YouTube channel, Citizen Investigation Team. They're all dead links on the website now, though. I did find a working link that took me to the discussion page. It's the CIT Research Forum, and the first thing you see at the top of the page is a donation link. No one, it appears, has donated money in some time, except for someone who gave them $10 four years ago. Aside from that, you have posts from as late as 2019, the majority of the posts come from 2009 to 2016. Many of those were posted in 2011 specifically. The most popular post is from 2008 and is titled Witness List Broken Down. What follows is a statement from the group. Hello all, here's a great resource for you all to use. It consists of a breakdown of all witnesses in relation to what they said versus what they actually saw or could have seen. I base this analysis on what was actually printed. Without direct confirmation and scrutinizing of witnesses, claims, and POV locations. They are merely static words floating around left to imply an impact. Seeing plane plus smoke fireball does not equal actually witnessing an impact. Seeing slash describing a plane plus reporters deduction sensationalizing about witness accounts does not equal actually witnessing an impact. Speaking with witnesses and clarifying the details of their account is the only way to get answers. Some witnesses are genuine and some are not. Some are real people with real lives who are confused and convinced by the attacks in New York while some are deep cover operatives or assets implicitly planting bogus information to make us chase our tails or delicately dancing between ambiguous statements. After this, they list five important witnesses of that day. Important to note, these witnesses all contradict each other in some way, making it hard to tell if any of them are genuine or not. Also, one witness changed their story after further questioning. This could have been a lapse in memory or something implanted through the questioning. Human memory is sadly a very fickle thing. Below these five is a list of others who claim to have been in the area but only saw the plane and not the impact. This list is far more extensive, but most of them weren't direct witnesses to the impact, which is what the group is trying to prove. The amount of witnesses that they tried to track down was pretty astonishing. There were over 100 people that the group attempted to contact for discussion, 
A lot of them were listed as confirmed, but I'm not sure what they're confirming. It seems like they were confirmed witnesses, but not in what they saw. Though there are so many people on this list that have claimed to see the plane. More than those that claimed it was a missile that they saw or heard. There were a few that claimed to have seen the light poles get hit by the plane before the crash. Though, those witnesses are scrutinized to have probably seen them after the fact. Beneath this is everyone talking about the events of the day. Everything from there being two planes, a missile attack, and a huge cover-up. The comments are what you'd expect from a conspiracy post, honestly. There's a lot of discussion around certain events and the possibilities. No one can really seem to agree, though. The final section is probably the most important part of the website. That's the info section. Here we have detailed info about every investigation the Citizen Investigation Team underwent. These are those articles. There are 18 in total, with several of them about the same topic. The starting point is the mission statement, listed at the bottom of the webpage. Let's start there. This is the mission statement. It's a pretty short read. Citizen Investigation Team is dedicated to exposing the truth behind the 9-11 attacks strictly via first-hand research and guerrilla investigative reporting efforts. We we'll limit our reporting to data that we have obtained ourselves from direct contact with eyewitnesses, first responders, victims, authorities, as well as complicit operatives in person and on location as much as possible. We refuse speculation and will only present hypotheses based off of data that we have personally obtained. Previous reports from mainstream as well as alternative media will never be assumed correct unless confirmed or clarified. We patently reject hypotheses that cannot be proven and therefore deliberately refuse no plain theories or anything based on the use of unknown or exotic weaponry, as much as we reject the official's conspiracy theory. Although we understand that it is possible for the suspects in question to have access to unknown technology, we believe that there is enough evidence available to prove the official story false without involving speculation in this regard. We stress the importance of on-site research and encourage others to make efforts to get answers with this approach. We advocate only non-violent solutions and are demanding truth, justice, peace, and the end of the fraudulent war on terror. This is a pretty strong mission statement. In this, they decry all the false conspiracy theories, claiming that the research they have done is the only one that you can trust. This is because they do reporting with actual witnesses and are simply searching for the truth rather than making something up to bring against the government. The thing is, no matter how many words they used to describe the reporting, they weren't there. They weren't inside the Pentagon on that day. They constantly debunk the idea of there being two planes at the Pentagon that day, a very popular conspiracy, because it doesn't match with the theory they came up with themselves. That the plane left the area after the explosion happened. An explosion they believed was caused by a planted bomb inside the building. The biggest denial that they have been running on this website is the existence of a second plane seen that day. The group claims that the second plane was part of a disinformation counterintelligence operation connected by the US government to distract from their claims. If people can easily disprove their conspiracy theory, then they can disprove theirs. Only, there was a second plane that day. A private jet owned by a company by the name of VF Corp. Their plane was making its descent when it was asked by Federal Aviation Administration Cleveland Center to fly over the area and report on what they saw. They did so, and then returned to their initial flight plan. This would be the second plane that many reported seeing that day. All in all, this is a website with a very specific belief they are wanting to spread. From what I've been able to uncover, most people have bought into this specific event. More people believe in the two-plane and missile conspiracy than this one. On my last day of examining the website, it was finally back online. So if anyone wants to check out the website with a large amount of data to sift through, you can. My biggest takeaway and warning is to go into everything with an open mind, but also be skeptical. Not every theory is a conspiracy, but not everything is a conspiracy. Necrocities is a domain website that allows users to make their own websites. The platform launched in 2013 and has hosted over 765,000 websites by now. There are some really interesting, really archaic, and kind of nostalgic websites that can be found here. I would love to do a full deep dive into some of these sites and the hidden discoveries we'd find, but I'm saving that for later. I mostly want to touch on a website I found. It's not a creepy or even disturbing website. No, it's kind of a hopeful one, actually. Here's astro.neocities.org. This website is a very simple one that was created in 2016. It says so on the only page that we can see. The title of the page is Astro's Last Drink. It has been 2,794 days, 5 hours, and 26 minutes, and counting since Astro's last drink. 
It's a sobriety website. It's really cool and I hope Astra is still doing well out there. This website is just one of the many that I found while exploring the internet. This website likely hasn't been seen since the time that it was created, but it still holds as a beacon of hope for someone out there. If you need a reason or a time to seek help, then maybe this website can help you to start your recovery journey. This next site is one that I found while exploring a rabbit hole of personal sites. This is the Alien Enigma, a website that serves as an online club for alien enthusiasts. Upon landing on the homepage, you're greeted with a website true to its time, captured in perfect 2000s disjointed format and crammed fonts full of color. To begin, I clicked on the first link, Alien. Welcome to Alien Enigma. This website has been set up as a forum to meet and exchange information between persons who become part of the UFO experience. If you have seen a UFO, if you are an abductee, or if you simply have an interest in the validity of these experiences, we intend to give you an opportunity to investigate and share the information available and to share your experiences. Not to believe in UFOs is simply no longer possible. What was once a matter of ridicule is now mainstream news. Government officials, pilots, astronauts, scientists in all fields, as well as everyday people have publicly stated that they have seen one or more UFOs. UFO sightings and investigations are not only nationwide, but worldwide. Abductees come from every walk of life, every culture, every faith, and every location on Earth. These experiences are very real and need to be treated in a sensible, intelligent way. There's also an attached YouTube channel. Oh, it's been removed for violating community guidelines. Never mind then. Going to their homepage, it's pretty much what you'd expect from a website of the era. We have a black background, some stars off to the side, and lots of blue text. At the top is the Alien Enigma title with dreams and experiencer projects written beneath it. An image of a UFO, a drawing of an alien, and another UFO image all sit below the text. On the left hand side, there are a group of links. These are home, alien, abductee, accounts, need to know, our experience, your experience, UFO pics, disclosure, reports, links, chat, UFO map 90 to 1989, UFO map 2000, Sightings and UFO Picks 2. Next on the link list, let's go to Abductee. This section has a huge list of abductee symptoms. Some of these include have had missing or lost time, been paralyzed in your bed with a being in your room, seeing balls of light or flashes, having a strong memory of something but no idea where it came from, have had dreams of eyes looking at you or have a fear of eyes looking at you, and have a feeling of being watched, especially at night, in total, the website lists 54 abduction symptoms, which is a bit of overkill if you ask me. These symptoms all seem to be unrelated, but maybe that's just what they want you to think. I have a fear of being watched through windows, but I doubt aliens are the cause behind that one. Sleep paralysis is also a symptom of abductees. So I guess all of you watching that have had this happen to you, well, now you know the source. Some of these make some sense to me, like having lapses in memory. This one was common amongst those that claimed to have been abducted many years ago. There's quite a few of these that feel like throwaways. As a few examples, having a paranormal experience, prone to compulsive behaviors, sexual or relationship problems, and having a hard time trusting others are not really symptoms of aliens. Most of these are likely due to mental illness rather than an alien abducting you on August 9th of 1972. I'm not sure aliens are the cause of your marital problems unless you spend all your time with them and not your spouse. At the bottom of this page is a disclaimer. Having one or multiple of these doesn't mean you're abducted by aliens. They have their own reasons outside of aliens, of course. And you should also see a therapist. I would suggest going through this list yourself as it is quite an interesting read. After reading that you have sleep issues because of aliens and not because of bad sleeping habits, you can view accounts. Right at the top of this page, you find an email where you can disclose your alien encounters to. There are so few accounts listed here. Either due to the website being older and some being taken down, because not many people actually experienced an alien event. Most of what I gathered was that 2001 was a very busy year for aliens for some reason. What was also odd is there are other accounts listed on this website, but they place them under different page links. Accounts, reports, need to know, our experience, your experience, and finally sightings all talk about someone's experience with aliens. The only difference is that the Our Experience page talks about the experience of Linda and Joe, the owners of Alien Enigma. This particular account reads almost like a novel or nowadays a reddit post. You should check it out for yourself and determine if you believe in this experience or not. Aside from the links to photos of UFOs and the alien sightings map, all that's left to Alien Enigma are the links, chat, and disclosure pages. Let's start with the disclosure page. 
since the link's page is filled with websites about aliens and sightings of aliens, as well as how to gather information about aliens. The disclosure page is just a personal soapbox for the website runners. It talks about how Dr. Greer, an educated professional, believes in aliens and how alien believers are no longer your crazy, backwaters neighbor. They're educated people and can be found in any and every walk of life. While this is true, it doesn't help that this whole webpage, and the website for that matter, is riddled with spelling and grammatical errors. At the bottom of the page, there's a link to Dr. Greer's website, which is expired. His book entitled Disclosure, Military and Government Witnesses Reveal the Greatest Secrets in Modern History, the book on Amazon retails for $55.95, a bit steep for any type of book, honestly. What is really important here is that it was published on May 9th of 2001. This could explain the rapid influx of alien sightings on the Alien Enigma website. There's one more link on the disclosure page, a link to an alien enthusiast named Art Bell. Unfortunately, Art Bell passed away on April 13th of 2018, but his website is still up and his radio shows are archived. His website mainly boasts photos of him and his family and some of the music he'd play as bumpers. Art's legacy website has a myriad of links about aliens and other cryptids. There's a lot to explore, but what I was really interested in was the radio shows. What was once a free audio stream has been replaced with a subscription service. There are a few videos on YouTube, but if anyone has listened to Art's UFO radio show, let me know how it is. The final link on this page that I will talk about is the chat link. This portion of the website is much more bare, probably due to its age. Imagine it was popping off with AOL emails left and right in 2001. There are a total of 27 entries visible on the chat link's guestbook. The earliest entry was on October 18th, 2001, and the latest was on January 7th, 2024. Yes, the website is still being paid for to this day, but doesn't seem updated at all. Most of the chats don't say much, but a few talk about their own experiences with UFOs and ask if anyone else has ever experienced something similar. Overall, Alien Enigma is a great time capsule surrounding the alien hype surrounding the whistleblowing release of Dr. Greer's project. This website is an interesting site to look through, but due to all its source code issues and repetitive nature, it's very bare. Most of what I learned from this website was a plethora of symptoms due to an abduction and the experience of others who have encountered these aliens. This ends our video into the forgotten websites that hide within the internet. I've been searching for a while for websites that interest me, and these are the ones that I found. They carry some interesting ideas, or have that old school web design that I find so nostalgic. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing and join the Patreon if you are so inclined. Thank you for watching my video, everyone. I want to thank my Patreon supporters, Nora Kingsley, Iceman, Ryoma, Meme Tendo, Miriam Reyes, and Austin Henshaw. Thank you all for your support. Hope to see you all in the next video.